The seminary student had turned in his sermon with the dull and uninspired title. The professor knew the man was capable of greater things, and so he said, Son, I want you to take this sermon that you've created, and I want you to take it back to your room. You've got to come up with a catchier title, something that's going to really grab your listeners and hold their interest. Do you understand? Well, the young man didn't quite understand. He wasn't great with fancy words. He said, how do I come up with a catchy title? He said, well, it's not so hard if you take just a few moments to picture this in your mind. Imagine that uh, all of your, the words of your title are on a marquee on bold black letters on the front lawn of the church. And it's announcing to everyone who comes by what the title of your message is going to be on Sunday. And here comes a Greyhound bus driving on the street. You want your title to be so innovative, so captivating, that that bus stops and every single person on the bus bounds off the Greyhound coming to church because of the title that you've given them. You got the picture in mind. He said, I think so. So he went to his room, spent some time thinking about the Greyhound bus and about the title, and he bounds in the next day with a brand new title page for his seminary professor. The title read, There's a Bomb on Your Bus. <laughs> that will get them going. <laughs> you know, sometimes our life starts off looking like a pleasant trip until all of a sudden something, boom, explodes in our path. You're driving down the street, paying attention to the speeding laws, and you come to the intersection, and all of a sudden, bam! You are T-boned by a driver who has run a red light and smashed into your vehicle. You get out, your car is totaled, your neck and your back are aching, and go figure, the guy has absolutely no insurance. The boss says, I want to see you in my office. You've been working hard. You're hoping for a raise. He says, we're going to have to let you go. You discover that your son is being indicted and sent to prison for dealing drugs. Your high school daughter comes home and breaks the news, I'm pregnant. There's a bomb on your bus. This was certainly true for the citizens of Israel in Psalm 75. They're coming right out of a crisis that we examined some time ago. That was Sunday, October the 22nd, or the 26th, when we studied Psalm 46. Now you may recall the bomb that was on their Israeli bus. The horrified Hebrews looked out across the walls of Jerusalem and they saw their hated enemy the Assyrian army, drawn up in battle array, ready to assault their city. The dreaded stormtroopers had already ravaged scores of city, and they had left in their path smoking ruins, flayed human beings who were screaming out their last moments on earth in agony and torment. And the same terrible stormtroopers are banked outside God's city of Jerusalem, and it looks like there's a big bomb on their bus. You might recall from that psalm we studied months ago that they had a propaganda chief named Rabshakeh who was attempting to demoralize godly King Hezekiah with a nasty letter that he wrote. And he sent him the letter across the wall saying, in essence, either you bow and yield or your bodies are going to become prey to the birds of the field. That's the only choice that we give you. Hezekiah was a man of God, so he took the letter to the prophet of God, Isaiah, and Isaiah said, don't submit to that man. Then the sun sets, and it's all quiet. Paralyzed Jews crawl into their beds and obviously spend the night without a single wink of sleep. They're terrified. They're dreading what the dawn's going to bring. At best, 
degradation and deportation, at worst, torment and torture. The sun rose, they peered over the walls of Jerusalem, and they could still see the Assyrian banners flapping in the eastern breeze. But what's this? There are vultures circling the Assyrian camp. And they look down. I can't believe it. The enemy is dead. The bomb has been diffused. God stepped in overnight and miraculously wiped out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Well, it's in the aftermath and the backwash of that incredible victory that Asaph penned the psalm that we studied in Psalm 46, and this one as well, Psalm 75. As you know, David wrote most of the psalms. Asaph ended up penning about 75 of them. The inscription says it was written for the choir director as a song to be sung, a word of praise for the congregation, to be voiced to God who delivered them. The inscription also says in my Bible, and probably yours, God abases the proud, but exalts the righteous. Thus our title, who goes up and who goes down. That's the secondary message. But the primary focus is on the greatness of God. Sure, we're going to see God's greatness, and we're going to see who goes up and who goes down, in the few verses of the 75th Psalm. Two points emerge. The first one is simply this. God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. Notice verses 1 and 2. It starts off with the triumphant note. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks. In the Hebrew language, the perfect tense is used, which says in essence, we have always given thanks to you, O oh God, because you've always been good and gracious to us. Your name is near. Men declare your wondrous works. When I selected an appointed time, it is I who judge with equity. God speaking. Note the emphasis on God's name that is mentioned in the first verse. You know, it's interesting in the Old Testament. It seems that whenever God wanted to reveal himself in a fresh way, he would use a new name. God has all kinds of names for himself in the Bible. When Moses said to Pharaoh, or to God, who will I say to Pharaoh has sent me? He said, you tell him, I am that I am. Yahweh, the ever-present God. At another point, God tells someone to call him El Shaddai, the Almighty One. At another point, he says to a person, call me Adonai, my personal Lord. He's also called Shalom, or actually Jehovah Shalom, which is Yahweh, my peace. He's called Jehovah Shira, or Jaira, Yahweh, my provider. These are numerous names, but the most predominant name that is found literally thousands of times in the Old Testament. And you'll know this name because whenever you see the word God used, this is the name. Elohim, the all-powerful creator of Genesis 1. And that's the name that's found right here in this passage. Aren't you glad that's the God that you serve? You're in touch with the most powerful person all eternity, who could change everything for you. Now, we read in this passage in verse 2, God judges with equity. That's why we are called not to judge others, because we judge on the basis of prejudice and emotion and feeling. God doesn't do that. He judges with perfect equity, perfect equality. He's not like Peter ripping a sword right out of a soldier and swinging it in the air, hoping to hit someone based on the surge of emotion. Peter pictures humanity. We're oftentimes out of control, driven by our emotions. God is not. God judges with wisdom. He acts deliberately. He acts decisively. And he selects an appointed time. God's timing in your life and for Israel, is always perfect. It may not feel that way right now, but it's perfect from his divine perspective. 
And um, when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, is marching right down to destroy Israel, he has no idea he's marching into God's appointed timetable. He's thinking, I've taken down Lachish, and now I'm going to take down Jerusalem. God said, no, I'm going to take you down without any Israeli soldier swinging a single spear. Because God likes to protect his people. Say that with me. God likes to protect his people. It was uh, the spring of 1962. I was attending Aliumanu Elementary School on the island of Oahu. And I remember the morning that I brought my brand new Civil War musket to class. So proud of that gun. Those were the wonderful days, weren't they? I don't like life today. Everyone lives on the basis of fear. You bring a toy gun today, oh my God, people are freaking out. You know, when Matthew was five years old, and he was, I think it was a kindergarten, some kid was hassling him, so he just took his gun and, or his finger and pointed at him. Oh, the teacher began screaming, grabbed Matthew, drug him down to the principal's office. He said, you little six-year-old terrorist. You know, people are nuts today with fear. In the good old days, you could take a toy gun to school. And I was very proud of that gun. But there was a, a sixth grade bully who wanted it. He said, let me see that Civil War musket. And I thought, he's either going to keep it or he's going to break it. So and I, can't, I said, I can't do that. He said, that's OK. I'll just be waiting for you after school. And I'm going to grab that musket of yours. I'm going to beat you up with it. All of a sudden, there was a bomb on my bus. I wasn't a fink. So I didn't say, teacher, please protect me because he plans on beating me up. That was the last thing I was going to do. I'd rather be beaten up first, you know. But I had been going to church for a while. I wasn't a Christian yet. But I had been taught how to address God. So I decided to utter a great theological prayer. Lord, help me! <laughs> and God did. After school, he surrounded me with a whole group of friends so that bully could not get through my buddies. And this went on for two solid weeks until he finally gave up and left me alone. And I learned as a fourth grader, even before I was a Christian, there's a God in heaven who loves to protect me. And that's the lesson God wants you to know today. It's the lesson the Israelis learned years before. God will come at the appointed time. He protects his modern people who love him. He protects his ancient people of Israel. There are people in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan who still haven't got that message. The folks of ISIS and ISIL and Hamas and Hezbollah would do well to remember they're not on God's side. They're on the side of evil. They're out to destroy God's people. You know what the number one, number one hit song in Palestine is today? I hate Israel. Number one on the Palestinian radio. They want to see all Hebrews dead. It ain't going to happen. God loves his people for no other reason than the fact that he promised his people, I'm on your team. And when you go against God's people, you go against the God of the Bible. I don't care what your political reference is. But I'm telling you, don't go against God's people. You are 150% wrong if you go in that direction. As uh, the Assyrians discovered in a very sad way on that particular evening. Verse 3. The earth and all who dwell in it melt. It is I who have firmly set its pillars. Now, the pillars he's referring to are the political structures of the world today. You say, I don't get this. 
The Bible says God's in firmly control of all the political structures that govern the planet. That's not what I see in the news. I see confusion. I see commotion. I see chaos that surrounds this planet. I look out and I see there's an economic recession that has hit large portions of Europe and America as people are looking frantically to find jobs and having a difficult time securing employment. Russia rising up again with the same power and fright that it used to have back in the 50s and 60s. North Korea nuts with their nuclear armament. Islamic terrorists threatening to wipe out not just Israel, but anyone in the West who says anything about them as we've seen 12 people butchered in cold blood in Paris this past week. They're out to kill everyone who is not Islam. And then we come to our country, a country that no longer tolerates but actually celebrates alternative lifestyles. A country that congratulates gender confusion with schools that are encouraging boys and girls to use the same bathroom. And you can decide to be a boy one minute and a girl the next. It's all up to you. They're applauding gender confusion. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that's evil. It's not acceptable. It's evil, regardless of what anyone tells you today. Folks, you need to get your life grounded in the word of God, not in what society and the news is telling you to believe in. Because that's what counts for eternity. So you look at all this confusion and all this commotion and all this incredible slippage that we have seen from what we once used to cling to when it came to morality in this country and in large sections of the world. And you're wondering how in the world could God possibly be in control of this planet? Well, he's in control in the same way that he was overseeing Israel when they were being beaten up by the Egyptians way back in Exodus. Didn't feel like he was in control, but it was. Read with me God's statement when he looked over the years of slavery. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who were in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I'm aware of their sufferings, for I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jerobosite, and the Termites. Exodus chapter 3, they're all there. So God said, I'm bringing them to a brand new land. And God sent a series of painful plagues to awaken the attention of Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh is thinking, let your people go. Are you nuts? I'm not going to speak to this little shepherd named Moses. Moses and his motley group of slaves is no match for someone like me. Or so he thought. A corporal reported to his regiment with a letter from his captain. And the letter said, this man is a great soldier, and he'd be even better if you could cure him of his constant gambling. And the new commanding officer said, son, I hear you're a gambler, and I don't approve. It's bad for morale and bad for discipline. By the way, what kind of thing do you bet on? He said, well, sir, practically anything. In fact, I'm willing to bet last month's pay that you have a strawberry birthmark on your upper right arm. And the commanding officer said, you son, you put your money down right now. And he took off his shirt and showed him conclusively no strawberry birthmark. He pocketed the bills. He called the captain from the other regiment and said, I don't think that boy that you sent me will be quick to make any more bets after what I did to him. And he told him the story. And the captain mournfully replied, don't be too sure. He waged me 20 to 200. he get you to take your shirt off five minutes after he reported. <laughs> that captain was no match for that corporal, and this Pharaoh is no match for this Moses. And finally, in frustration, he said, get your people out of here. Go. But then halfway through, he 
changed his mind. And then Israel was caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. And God said, Moses, lift your staff. He split the sea. They passed through in perfect timing. God's timing is always perfect when it comes to his people. But you won't always see that when it comes to those who have the peacock arrogant attitude. And that's the second part of the psalm. Even though point one, God's timing is perfect, point two comes before us now. Here it is. God takes down the proud. God takes down the proud. One of the clear and repetitive statements in all books of Scripture, don't become arrogant. Don't boast about who you've known or what you've done or what you can do today. If you do, you're ready for a major tumble. God honors those who are humble. Look at verses 4 to 5. I said to the boastful, do not boast. To the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Verse 5, do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with insolent pride. You know, before it lowers its head to attack, a horned beast proudly lifts his horns on high as if to say to the animal kingdom, look at me, I'm taking this one down. And when God sees a human being lift up, he says, that's the one I'm going to cut down. So if you stay low, you're going to be fine. It's like military, right? My dad used to tell those uh, young privates, you know, you keep your head down, you're going to get it blown off in battle. Same thing in the Christian life. You want to get your head blown off? Stick it up. God will knock it right down every single time. He wants people to stay humble. Don't lift up the head. That word lift up keeps popping up in this passage. In fact, I see the words lift up in verse 4. See that? In verse 5, do not lift up. In verse 6, I see it in verse 7. I see it in verse 10 about the idea of exalting and pushing yourself up. God is not for the one who wants to be lifted up. All these terms are associated with arrogance. Look at verses 5 and 6. Don't lift up your horn on high. Don't speak with insolent pride. And then we'll come to verse 6 in just a second. The problem with pride is that God always likes taking down those who use it. This was illustrated to me in a very picturesque way. On November the 10th, 2014, I was watching an interesting sports clip of a pro receiver who had caught this beautiful touchdown bomb and no one was around him. He beat out all of his defenders. And so with great finesse and joy, he just runs across the goal line and feels he's accomplished this tremendous victory, unaware of the fact that in his little victory jaunt, he accidentally dropped the football one yard short of the goal line. So here he is in the end zone. Aha! You know, they do the dance. And the camera goes off of him, focuses to the defenders who have picked up the ball and are running the opposite way for a victory. I'm laughing, thinking, what a stupid idiot. All because he couldn't wait to do his little dance that said, look at me. Here's the principle. Let's say it together. When we feed pride, we play the fool. Every single time. Verse 6. Not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert comes exaltation. The desert would be the south. So you got the south, the east, the west. What's missing? The north, exactly. Why is the north eliminated? It seems that the north is where God's throne is at. Let's read together Isaiah 14, shall we? But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit in the mount of the assembly. And the recess is where? The north. The north. 
exactly. When Ezekiel described his vision of the four living creatures, Ezekiel 1.4, he said, I looked and beheld a whirlwind coming out of the north. The north. And we're told in the Bible, in Leviticus 1.11, when you bring an offering, you slay it on the side of the altar, watch this, northward toward God. Astronomers tell us as they look into the night sky, the eastern, western, and southern portions of the heavens are filled with stars, but the north section is comparatively empty. It seems this is where God's throne is located. All that is interesting insight to draw home the point that's being sent here. When you want to be exalted, when you're hoping for a promotion, you want to praise a people, go to God. Don't use your ingenuity. Do not promote yourself. Don't think that clever plans, well-timed phone calls, or kissing up to powerful people is going to make it happen for you. The only way it's going to really happen is when you trust the Lord. Let him promote you. If you're struggling with your children because they're not being responsive to you, if there's tension between you and your spouse, spending more time in argument, more time in anger, more time in distance will accomplish nothing. Get on your knees, ask God what he wants, and wait for the exaltation of that relationship. This is true in every single area of our lives. Go to God. Don't go to your ingenuity, your cleverness. God could use that at some point, but initially you must trust him. Promotion comes from the Lord, so don't exalt yourself. That's the point that he's making. Let him lift you up, verse 7. But God is the judge, and what does he do? He puts down one, and he exalts another. Now, if you doubt that, it would be wise to check out Hebrew history and see what God has done to all the powerful nations of the world who have chosen to hate the Jews. Starting with Egypt, he humiliated them terribly on the banks of the Red Sea. And then Babylon was the strongest nation of its day. He knocked them out. Then the Assyrians came along. We saw today he knocked them out. And then Greece was a wonderfully brilliant nation. He knocked them out because of the way they treated the Jews. And he knocked out Rome because of their treatment of God's people. And then Nazi Germany looked like it was going to last forever in the early 40s. And they were knocked out beyond description because of the way they treated the Jewish people. And people still, hello, are not getting it in the world today. Many people across America are not getting it. They're siding with the wrong group. And people in the Mideast are not getting it either. They continue to hate the Hebrews. Palestinian men from East Jerusalem entered a synagogue in West Jerusalem on November the 18th, armed with knives and gun, and just started butchering people, worshiping God. Palestinian militants from Jerusalem have been staging lone wolf attacks on Jewish Israelis for the last several months. We all heard about the Palestinian man who just decided to take his car and just ram it into a tram stop and kill innocent people. In early November, two Israeli Jews, one in Tel Aviv and another in the West Bank, were stabbed by Palestinian assailants. This stuff goes on all the time. God is watching, and God permits it for a time. But in the end, he says, enough is enough. That's what he said to Egypt. He said to Assyria, he said to Babylon, he said to Rome, and he said in some of your lifetime today to Nazi Germany. And he's going to be saying that today to those nations who hate Israel. And if this nation ever decides to go against Israel, we are headed into the septic tank. I'm telling you that from the teaching of the Word of God. Don't you side with those who are against God's people. Doesn't make any difference what you think of Jewish people. God doesn't care about your feelings on that. God cares about his facts. And his fact is he promised back in chapter 12 of Genesis, I will bless those who bless you, 
and I will curse those who curse you. That has never, ever been revoked. And if it is revoked, then God is not God. He doesn't exist. So you need to make a decision as a Christian. Do you believe the word of God? Or are you going to chuck it all aside and go the way of the world? Very, very important. God takes care of his people. Don't go against them. And those who go against you as a Christian will eventually be punished as well. Because you are his people today. And he will exalt his people, and he will honor his people, and he comes through for them. He's the God of equity, he's the God of justice, and when he keeps a promise, he makes it, he always keeps it. Very important. Now look what he says in verse 8. A cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed, and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. Wow, that's powerful. You know, the cup is a very familiar image of judgment in Scripture. Did you know that? Let's read a few passages just to refresh that to our memory. Let his own eyes see his decay. Let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Hmm. Here's another one. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations whom I send you to drink it. So the cup is a sign of judgment from God's perspective. Now, this is a cup that's called a mixed drink. The Jews usually diluted their wine with water so the intoxicants weren't quite so high. But in this passage, God said, I'm mixing it, as it were, with various types of alcohol. It's going to be a very potent, powerful, alcohol-driven drink to take the person down. I read about a preacher who had a rescue mission. He was attempting by means of a visual illustration to demonstrate the evils of alcohol. And so he brought out a beaker of water and put a little worm in it. And the worm swam around and smiled, had a great time, and everyone applauded. Then he brought out a beaker of alcohol and dropped worm number two into it. And that little worm struggled to keep his head above the alcohol, and eventually he succumbed to the spirits, and he went to the bottom and drowned. And everyone was sad. And he looked out across the congregation and said, Now, gentlemen, what lesson do we learn from this illustration? And a fellow way in the back said, If you drink alcohol, you'll never have worms. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you can have cirrhosis of the liver and pancreatitis and a broken home and ruptured relationships and sadness and shame. In Japan, land of the rising sun and land of the rising rate of alcohol, they have a proverb that says, first the man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes the man. Now, in this case, God said, I'm mixing the drink. And I'm giving it to any nation that hates my people. And they will drink it, and they will die. Powerful words. Powerful thoughts. Verse 8. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. Would you like to see the ultimate drink of those who drunk with arrogance refuse to receive God's gift of grace on Calvary? And hold your finger here and turn all the way to the last book of the Bible. Let's look at Revelation chapter 14 for just a moment. Revelation 14. Verses 9 and 10.
Then another angel, the third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast at his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. I tell you, that's absolutely terrifying. Here's the great news. No one on this planet, regardless of how evil they may be at this moment in time, no one on this planet needs to ever put their lips to that cup. God in his grace and tenderness, has already drank it. Amen. That's why the cross is always here, to remind us of the drink. You remember uh, last week when Lewis talked to us about communion, he mentioned Christ in Gethsemane. That's when the cup came. What did Jesus say to his father in Matthew 26, 39? Father, if it's possible, remove this what? This cup from me. This cup. This cup. The, ca the cup of wrath. The cup of judgment. The cup of damnation. The cup of hell and the lake of fire. That's the cup that Jesus had to drink from. A cup that God wants no man to ever touch. Three times alone in the garden he prayed, not my will, but thine. He shed no tears for his own grief, but he sweat drops of blood for mine. You know, when Jesus looked into that cup, he saw all the sins of all the people who have ever existed on this planet. And it freaked him out. That's why he prayed not once, but three times. No way do I want to touch that. He knew from eternity past exactly what his plan was, but it wasn't until that moment that he realized the intensity of the magnitude of the misery he was going to have to endure. That's why he sweat drops of blood. He was under unbelievable torture and torment in the garden, as much as the torture or torment that he experienced on Calvary. And it was so frightening and so scary and so scale-tipping at that point that the Bible tells us God had to send an angel from heaven to strengthen Jesus. Why? Had the angel not come, he would have died right there in the garden and never made it to Calvary where the ultimate price would have to be paid. He went through all that agony, all that torment, all that torture for us. And when a person says, I don't need it, I don't want it, I'll choose another religion, I'll choose another path, I'll choose the life of goodness, God from heaven says, you've got to be kidding. Really? You think I'm going to allow you into my heaven after what my son endured for you? Lots of luck on that one. Oh, if we even begin to understand what he endured for us, we would not consider any other route to heaven. But if a person in their arrogance says, you know, I don't want it. Then, uh, if they resist his grace, God will insist they drink the cup of agony for all eternity. As the great theologian Dallas Willard said, hell is just the best that God could do for some people. Just the best. Because they choose it. 
Oh, but as for me, verse 9, <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not drinking from that cup. As for me, verse 9, he says, I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. And the horns of the wicked, he's going to cut off. But the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. So in the end, God's going to wipe out the wicked. He's going to restore the righteous to the rightful place in life. And he will diffuse the frightening bomb at the right time. Because it was to be discovered in her first point, God's timing is always perfect. Cindy Casper writes, it was quite a few months before I realized what I had thought was a coincidental meeting had been great timing on my future husband's part. From the balcony of the church, he had seen me and deduced which exit I might be using, racing down two flights of stairs and arriving seconds before I did. He casually held the door and struck up a conversation. I was oblivious to the fact that his impromptu dinner invitation had been premeditated. It was all perfect timing. You know, perfect timing is rare for human beings, but not for a holy God. He has perfect timing for this universe. He has perfect timing for every nation on this planet. And he has perfect timing for every single event that occurs in your life if you're a child of God today. And he will step up. And he will step in for you when the time is right. Let's bow together. Galatians 4.4 4 says, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son to redeem us. So God arrived on the planet at the perfect time. Will you release your life to him at this time? He drank the cup of suffering for you. But if you refuse that cup, you will have to drink it forever. It's possible that you're present today and you've been associated with Orange Coast Community Church for some time. There was never a point in time when you released everything to your Redeemer. It's a decision that you must personally make. You must release your life into his capable hand and officially become his child for everything to change in your heart today. Right there where you're seated, that decision could be made. All it takes is a heartfelt prayer that goes like this. Father, I know that your son drank the cup of judgment for me on the cross. He's been so gracious and so good. I don't want to drink from that cup. I don't want to spend eternity apart from you. I want to be in your presence. I want to be with your people and experiencing your joy forever. I confess my life of sin. I invite Jesus into my heart right now. Come reign in me, Lord Jesus, and accept me as your son or daughter by faith. If you prayed that prayer today and you let God into your life, then before you leave today, just kind of whisper in my ear, Pastor, I prayed the prayer. I gave my life to Christ today, and I'll rejoice with you. Father, it's wonderful news to be one of your children. It's scary news to be on the opposite side of the fence. Thank you that you have chosen us from before the foundation of the world. And help us not to keep this gift to ourselves. Help us by means of the word of mouth, by means of the new pens that we've received, to tell people about Jesus, to invite them to Orange Coast, 
and to grow your kingdom before the day of judgment arrives on this planet. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>